here with Hall Saul Associates in Toronto. He'll be speaking today on rational evaluation and management of pre-stressed concrete structures. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about um, rational evaluation and management of pre-stressed concrete structures. In the last 30 years, we have a fairly large inventory of uh, pre-stressed concrete structures that has the, in the North, in North America, essentially. Um, some of these structures, unfortunately, because of construction practices, have seen some deterioration. And there's a large concern among the public as well as among, among the consulting engineers on how to manage these structures. Typically, the repairs tend to be quite expensive, and there is no simple way of doing the repairs. It's quite disruptive sometimes as well. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking, and hopefully, by the end of the presentation, I hope to convince you that it's probably a managed way is a better way of doing this sort of work. I'd like to acknowledge my, acknowledge my co-author, Stéphane Trepanier, um, again from Halter Associates, and he's been involved with a lot, lot of this work um, with me. Um, essentially, typically, when you see a structural engineer typically gets involved on a structure, once it's built, after it's built, the structural engineer never hears about the structure. Only time when they hear about it is um, if there's an assessment required. And typically, these are some of the cases when you, when you do, do need an assessment on the structure, when there's a change in occupancy of, or there's a, st a structural upgrade, you need to increase the loads in the structures. There's some damage to the post-tensioning cables um, by some people putting mechanical finishes on the structure are doing some other construction work in which they accidentally cut strands up. And then the owner gets really concerned that why um, that we have some cut strands in the structure and, and looks for a review of the structure. You may have sometimes a real estate transaction in which a due diligence is required. And the structure unit sometimes gets involved looking at the structure and saying whether we need to uh, do an evaluation of the structure. Sometimes you can see some failure, signs of failure. In some buildings, you see some big cracks happening. And, and then the owner gets quite concerned, and they, they, they call an instruction to review the structure and evaluate it. Or this is some, some portion of the structure have actually failed, and then you have a forensic investigation required for that condition. OK. Um, typically, what happens is, um, in most cases, from what I have seen, is that um, the first two items are, are the ones that are really done. Uh, in most cases, um, what, I'm, what I hope to sort of say, show you is that the last two bits are as important or more important as, as the first two ones. Um, typically, what you do is you do an, uh, an in, in, in initial in, in evaluation of the structure in which you go in, you look at the structure, you do a, a fairly thorough evaluation of what is there in the structure, look at the conditions that the structure is in. Um, based on the results, you basically go and do a much more detailed analysis, do some analysis, do the calculations, see what the reserve capacity of the structure is. And then um, the other two points are what, you need, what we also need to think about uh, uh, or the owners need to think about is more of a structural monitoring. Um, it's like any other structure or any other piece of equipment uh, where, you need, where you have some repair costs uh, which are going to be there just to make sure that your structure is, is functioning properly. Um, so that's something that needs to be kind of to be dealt with as well. Um, scheduling repairs, as Greg Gary has mentioned, it's a it's always a very difficult task to go into a structure which is occupied and say we need to do a lot of repairs in the structure. We need to evacuate the structure. You always have to work with the owners um, and the property manager and work with them to come up with the best sort of repair scheme. Sometimes it may involve that you may be doing different schemes. Which, is what, which may not be the most efficient structural schemes, but they are the ones that really would make the structure um, really work for the owner or for the client. It also looks at what sort of long-term goals they have, whether they want to get rid of the structure at some point in their life, or what, what do they want to really do with the, what their plans are for the structure. Um, typically, when uh, I, I'll just go through some of the steps that you typically go through it. In an initial investigation uh, evaluation, what you do is you will go and review existing drawings. Not often will you find ex all the existing drawings for structures, and you have to find different ways of getting the drawings. So you can either go to the city to find some of the drawings or to other places where you may be able to get some drawings. In absence of drawings, you can go into see if you have uh, some old reports, or you can do 
a survey of some of the things and to get an idea of what the structure is like to get some confidence on the structure. Um, you, you do a nice walk around or a very detailed walk around, spend a few hours on, on the structure to walk around and look at some of the things which may raise some red flags, um, like large deflections, wide, wide cracks, um, erupted strands, particularly in post-tension post -tension structures, um, brass stains or grease stains that you may see in the structure. There may be some missing or loose grout plugs which you may just see from outside, um, or there may be some exposed strands in the structure. That may cause some red flags to go in that there are some construction problems on the structure and we need to do a bit more detailed evaluation of the structure. Um, this slide shows actually two things. One, that is an, that's, a, that's a strand that's broken right beside that. There's a fairly large crack right beside it. That would sort of raise a flag to you saying um, there is something um, which is wrong in the structure. It needs to be worked on and look, looked at more carefully. Um, this is again an erupted strand. Um, there was essentially, this is the soffit of the slab. There wasn't, there wasn't any cover, so it was sort of right at the surface. And when the strand broke, actually, it just erupted out of the slab. Again, this is a construction issue, the original construction, but things to look for in a structure when, you, when, you, when you're doing an, a, a, a visual evaluation of the structure. Again, here you see is the strand is actually protruding out of the building edge, and uh, just it, it's got an erupted strand right through the building, and that would sort of raise some, some flags saying this is a post-tension building. <laughs> we better look at this building a little bit more carefully. <laughs> the glass seems to be broken out there, so it is visible, quite, quite visible from outside. Um, you can sometimes see grease stains on the, on the soffit of beams and slabs. That tells you that um, the sheets uh, of the post-tensioning cable is broken or ruptured in some ways, and there is um, good potential of access to water into the sheets, and, 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 and perhaps that, that would raise a flag saying we need to do a bit more evaluation or investigation on this structure. Um, oops. You can sometimes see the, these sort of fairly strong rust stains. Um, this was a structure in which we saw a lot of rust staining. And this was an interesting case in which they actually, seems like the builder did not know what they were doing. So there's an expansion joint running right up there with intermediate anchors. And the, because the, there was a leakage in this particular expansion joint, uh, construction joint, basically the owner decided to put in a nice gutter right here. You can see what, 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 we, what we can see sometimes in that situation. Um, sometimes you go and look at the edges and you'll see that the grout plug, part of the, uh, part of the tendon edges sort of, or, or the grout plug is sort of deteriorated. And you can see the tendon edges very, very clearly. Um, in other cases, the, it's quite, a, again, this is the same structure as the previous one, the, the two slides before I showed you. Um, again, you can quite clearly see that the tendon is quite exposed and uh, the water has easy, easy access to that. If you, if you look closely to the, to the edge of the tendon, you can actually see some of the tendons have actually ruptured and broken out of the, and they are protruding out a bit more from the, from the edge or the anchor um, in the structure. This is a strange one. Um, I have never seen this before. <laughs> but in this case, the, 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 the contractor decided that instead of putting a, a grout plug, they wanted to put some styrofoam. It's just a way of uh, protecting it. So they decided to put some styrofoam right behind um, the grout plug and then put a little bit of a concrete in front of it. <laughs> and you, see, you can see what happens here is the, there's rust and um, corrosion right, right at the anchors here. And that generally raises some flags saying there's, there's potentially more problems on, on a structure of this nature and we need to do a much more detailed investigation of the structure. Um, this is again a, a condition in which at the top of the slab there wasn't enough cover and when, when this was a parking slab um, and when the cars went by basically whatever the sheath was there basically got eroded. And you, you, it was a good potential place for the water to get into the, the strands. Um, again one of the things that you would look at and say this needs a bit more investigation on that. Um, once you've done a sort of a quick visual evaluation or investigation of the structure, um, based on the results, you can go in and do a bit more detailed evaluation of the structure, in which what you do is you do some exploratory openings, small openings, maybe about eight inches or so wide. Um, look for rust in the strands, look for a loss of cross-section area. Sometimes you can see it, sometimes you cannot see it as easily from there. Um, what you can also do is look at the condition of the, uh, of the grease. Um, 
Sometimes the grease is coagulated and you have some moisture, evidence of moisture in the grease, that should raise some flags saying there, is, there may be potential problems on the strands there. Because you cannot expose every single strand over the whole length. You have to sort of go by what you can see in these conditions. Um, again, what you do is, again, you look at the protective sheathing. Again, the same situation if you have some grease um, that's flowing out of the sheath, you would, you would get concerned about those things. Um, the last is a penetration test. This is basically also known in the industry as a screwdriver test. What it does is you take a piece of screwdriver and you try and wedge it between two wires of a strand. Um, it's actually quite a good test. What it does is it gives you an idea, although you may not be at the location of the strand or of a wire break, but you can see to a certain distance if there's a wire break, you can, you can sense it. The other thing that it's very useful for is that it will tell you whether a tenant has some stress or not. Um, particularly some of the experienced people can actually tell if the, if the tenant is understressed in this sort of a test. Um, this actually shows you a wet strand. If you just, is there somebody just cutting up a strand and you see water coming out of it, that raises some flags right, right off the bat saying, there are some problems here. Let's look at the structure in more detail. Um, this again is a, another strand which is fairly corroded. You have some of the wires which are broken on this particular section. Um, there's lots of water, uh, evidence of water here. Um, again, that, that would sound that, that you may have continued activity of um, sort of uh, problems in, in this sort of a situation. Um, sometimes you actually see that although there is no water there, there is um, evidence of pitting corrosion. Um, partly this has been caused in some of the structures, and I, and I, and I believe uh, this has been partly responsible for is the grease. They did not have enough corrosion inhibitors in the Greece or in the early, early times when, when the post tensioning was just sort of starting off. And sometimes you would see some of these conditions and loss of cross section in the strand. You'd sometimes take out the strands and see that. Um, this is a classic example for that. Um, in the last few years, we've also noticed some anaerobic problems uh, with people have contemplated that it's perhaps some bacteria that's causing the, the steel to corrode. I don't know enough about that area, but um, perhaps there are some other influences that, that also happen here, and that should be just looked at and be careful about things. Um, this is a, a button head system, and you can see there's a, just near the anchors, it's a fairly badly corroded system again, uh, or a corroded strand. Um, most of the strands are corroded. There is some carbonation here to some extent. Um, things to be sort of wary of, and you can see that. Um, I was talking about the penetration test. We use a slide hammer instead of just the screwdriver, uh, typically, and we find this is a bit more um, accurate or a little bit better in terms of the amount of energy that you put into the strand, and you're able to do a bit more, better evaluation of the strand in compared to just a, taking a, a screwdriver and, and putting it and hitting it with a hammer. It, this is a bit more controlled and it gives us better results in that situation. Um, the detailed evaluation will also, once you've done um, preliminary evaluation of the structure, and depending on the conditions, you may want to do a much more detailed evaluation in which you'd go in, you'd want to measure the pre-stressing force. The whole object of a very detailed evaluation is to come up with a full structural analysis of the structure and see if there's any reserve capacity on the structure to tolerate some strand breakers, breaks on it. Um, in that sort of situation, what you need to do is measure the pre-stressing force, which may be a little bit different than what the original construction drawing showed. It's, it's typically the case that you may find the stress in the strand to be a little bit bigger or a little bit higher um, than um, what was actually uh, measured on the, uh, or what was spec'd in the drawings based on the losses. Um, in other cases, you may find it to be much less. And some of the techniques to do that are sort of, uh, there's a little technique that we use for uh, measuring the force. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. You can cut the strand up. It's a destructive technique, um, but that gives you an idea of what the stress is on the strand. By, by measuring the shortening of the strand and knowing the length of the strand, you can come up with an estimate of what the strand forces on, on an average basis. You can do some lift-off tests. This involves typically casting another anchor in front of the, pre, the, the existing anchor and then using the, the tail end of the anchor to, to, to pull it, to pull the strand so that you can see the, the end of the strand coming out um, and then the forces balance in that condition. Um, strand extraction I mentioned before, you can also measure the concrete strength. 
for a structure analysis. The basic objective is to do a full structure analysis to evaluate what sort of capacities do you have in this, this lab. Um, sometimes it may be practic practical, as Gary had ma has mentioned, to do a load test on the structure and see what sort of capacities you have. But that only gives you one point in, in, in the time history of your structure. At this point, it does satisfy the load test, but you, you cannot really extrapolate it to, if you have more breaks in the uh, on the structure, what would that do to the structure? Um, I mentioned that I would be talking a little bit more about this frame for a tension test. Um, we've developed a simple frame where what, what you can do is, you can take the strand, expose about two feet of the strand, and just um, um, put some lateral load on the strand and measure the deflection. And based on the deflection and the, the force that you applied, it's fairly simple statics. You can actually de determine the force in the cable that is there. Um, we've got some very good results out of the lab testing that we've done on this and in the field testing that we've done. This just shows some of the curves. In the practical range, which is about 100 kilonewtons um, or about 25 kips to about 150 kilonewtons or about um, 40 kips, I would think, um, 35 kips. That, that's, the, that's the common range and the results are fairly good in that range um, from these tests and it can easily replace um, the lift-off test or the strand cutting. That's what we've been doing typically in the past. Um, once you've got a good information on the structure, what you then do is you do a model of the structure, a structural model of it, do a fairly comprehensive analysis to figure out what the reserve capacity of, of brakes is in the structure. If it, is, if it was designed very, very tightly, um, some of the code changes have created some opportunity in this region and I guess there was some discussion about uh, secondary moments. They actually sometimes help you in terms of getting a few more breaks in the structure. And the code lets you do that. Um, you can use some of those uh, things to sort of justify a few breaks. But if you have a lot of breaks, then you definitely have to come up with a, come up with a much um, uh, a repair, te uh, repair technique for the structure. And this can vary essentially based on what is required uh, by the owners. So the, the, there's quite a few considerations of the owners. You can use strand replacement like that. You basically can take the strand and replace a part of the strand, which is corroded by putting a coupler here and then stressing it from, from, from an intermediate point. Um, you can put in steel plates on the structure to strengthen it in flexural conditions. You can put carbon fiber sometimes, and that actually gives you additional capacities and you can tolerate some of the breaks um, in that sort of situation. Um, or you can go external post tensioning to strengthen the structure up. So this, or a combination of any of these techniques can be used, um, depending upon again what the owner is, uh, or what are the conditions of the structure. It's on an individual structure. You can come up with a technique that would work uh, for a particular structure. Um, I mentioned that once you've done your initial evaluation, you need to sort of look at and do a continuous monitoring of the structure on the future. There are a couple of techniques that are typically used by us. Uh, one of them is acoustic monitoring. Jack elaborated quite well on this. Um, so you can use that to see if you have continued activity on the structure of breaks. And if, the, if, if you do find that there's lots of breaks, then you definitely have to go and do something about the structure <coughs> and make decisions on that. Um, with some owners, that, that tends to be quite expensive and they, you can sometimes do is, um, a periodic investigation every two years or a year, you would go in and expose some strands, look at the previous uh, strands that you have and see what sort of conditions they are in, and then expose more to increase the, data, uh, the database of strands that you have or uh, information that you have in the structure, and that gives more confidence in terms to the engineers in terms of what you can tolerate as breaks. Um, after you've done the uh, periodic inspection, what you also then do is do a more, more analysis again, structure analysis to prove um, if the structure works with the renewed number of breaks, or if it doesn't work, then you, what, is, what would be the most efficient or economical repair strategy? Sometimes uh, it may be possible that when you, when you go into a structure, you actually do a little bit more work than what was originally thought about or what would be required by the code. And that is to prevent against future breaks Typically, there's a lot of uh, costs involved in terms of uh, mobilizing and demobilizing and disruption to the tenants or to the people in the structure. So you may want to think about doing a little bit more work when you get into the structure and, and, then, and then continue that on for, that will give them a cushion of future wire breaks in that sort of situation. Um, 
Basically, when you do that, you can go and update your repair recommendation in that situation. The, you, you can see I stole the slide off from Jack here. Um, acoustic monitoring, as I mentioned, is a technique which, uh, as Jack has already elaborated quite a bit more, so I'm just going to skip over this. Is you can use that to predict the wire breaks and locate the wire breaks quite, quite, quite effectively, actually. Um, it works in a triangulation principle again. Um, so you can actually locate the wire break and the direction of the wire, and you can go and confirm that when you do the investigation on it. Um, this was a slide that he did not show, but you can also plot an energy diagram of the wire break condition, and that gives you a better condition of uh, what the, where the wire break is. Um, what you, if you want to do a periodic inspection, what you then do is you go in, you conduct, you, you look at the previous openings that you've made in the structure, and you take some more samples of the cable to get a better handle on a statistical basis of what sort of condition you have on the structure. Um, based on that, you can, give in a, you can come up with a managed repair strategy. Um, a lot of this, again, has to do with what are the operational needs of the, of the owner in, in, in question. Um, if you have, and, and the confidence that you have on the existing condition of the structure, if you have an acoustic monitoring system and you can track every wire break, it may give you a more of a cushion, and you may decide to go step a little bit further and say, I will, I will only come back and repair when there is five wire breaks. Um, if you do periodic inspection, you may be a little bit more tight. Um, in case you have no other way of doing an inspection, you will probably end up doing all of the repairs that are needed at any time. But this seems to, this tends to be a little bit more economical and a bit more rational as an approach. Uh, for repairing of these structures. Um, owner's needs are, are extremely important. Uh, you see what, what timing is best, uh, what are the needs of the owner, um, how can you do the work in a very scheduled way, so it's least amount of dis disruptions to the owner. Um, they tend to, to really dominate the, what you do in terms of the repair, or what strategies you use for the repair of the structure, and how do you manage the whole repair process. Um, and, and sometimes you can use some statistical methods to predict future breaks, and that helps you in terms of uh, doing the amount of repair. You can use some statistical calculations and see if you've been having a certain number of breaks a particular year with acoustic monitoring, you can predict future, future wire breaks and do some of this work here. Um, and basically, for, to conclude, what I would say is uh, using a manage approach um, helps you to manage, or the owners manage their risk. They can schedule the repairs, they can build it into the capital plans, and that actually helps them in terms of what they're doing, how, how do they repair the structure on, a, on an ongoing basis. Instead of going in um, and doing it on a firefighting basis, you do a, a little bit of repair every year, and that helps um, in that situation. Um, it helps you the manager, it helps the engineers manage the risk. You're not always saying, I do not know what the structure is like. You have a history with the structure. You sort of have, know how the structure behaves. Gives you a bit more confidence on it. Um, it helps you optimize your costs, again, because what you're doing is each time you go to the structure, you do a lot more repair at, at that one location, but then you don't have to go back to that same location for, for quite, a lot, quite a period of time. And you're not just doing it at each location. Um, I, I think it, this, this process actually reduces the overall cost of repairs as well um, as, uh, and, and basically helps the structure maybe be managed a bit better um, than just going in once and doing the repairs. Thanks very much, and I appreciate the time you've given me. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. No questions. Yes? Predicting like future costs of repair. Yes. Um, how do you estimate uh, sort of rates of corrosion or rates of wire breaks? Um, what typically happens is that um, statistically you can use, um, if you have a history with the structure, if you know what sort of rates of wire breaks you're having, there is no guarantees in that, but what you can do is use that if you've had five, five wire breaks of five strand breaks every year, um, you can actually go back and say, I'm probably going to have five or six in that order of magnitude every year, and use that as a predictor for future repairs. So it's pretty good, pretty much using, assuming it's going to... It's a statistical basis. Yeah. It's not a... Yes, that. Have you uh, ever uh, considered sort of mitigation 
injury that associated with explosive blowouts, and uh, how do you deal with that? Um, blowouts in terms of uh, eruptions. Wire breaks come right through the slab. Yes. Um, there are a few ways that we've dealt with that situation. Um, in some cases, uh, as, I, as, I, as I showed the slide of a wire breaking out um, of, uh, or, or erupting out of a slab, that is typically concerned by the owners. Um, haven't seen that many problems in terms of just the soffit of the slab or the top of the slab, because you typically lose a lot of the energy when the wire breaks um, in that system. But at the edges, you do see that problem sometimes. And, um, in some cases, we've used uh, plates, steel plates, which are bolted to the edge of the slab to avoid some of those problems. Yeah, just a follow-up comment. That one, one of the recommendations to me was in the situation is to just look at the actual cover of the concrete and do a, a concrete cover survey over your bars. If you have more than, say, 20, 30 millimeters, then maybe you're not going to get the, uh, as, as, as much as explosive uh, blow up through the slab. But you get a lot of shallow, shallow. True. Um, the typical recommendations that have been there in the code have, have had a minimum of 20 millimeters of cover in most slabs. Um, so you really typically don't see a problem with that condition. But you certainly would see it if you have no cover um, below the slab. But again, in most cases, as you saw here, was the, the tendon does not really go out of its way and it doesn't really hurt anybody. Yes, it, it, would, it would hang out sometimes, but it, it's, really, it's rare that you would see that it would actually go and, and damage, do some significant damage, damage because um, when it goes out of the sheath, there's a lot of energy, energy dissipation that goes into the, into the wire, or into the, into the slab itself. Okay, thank you, go on. Thanks, Jeff.